Our first speaker is the president of the Illinois Institute of Technology. He is the holder of two patents and the author of over 200 publications. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Let's give him a round of applause for Alan Cram. Alan, come on up. Come on. There we go. Our second speaker is the founding principal of John Ronan Architects. He earned his Master's of Architecture degree with distinction from the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Our second speaker also earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Michigan. He is currently a Professor of Architecture at ITT, where he has taught <laughs> IIT. You know, when you're typing these things and trying to serve your four children breakfast, it isn't that easy. <laughs> I-I-T, okay, Jeannie? Where he has taught for 24 years. I'm glad you're all paying attention. Ladies and gentlemen, John Ronan. Hey, come on up, come on up. Alan, the show is yours. So would anyone like to guess why we changed the name to Illinois Tech? <laughs> It really is a pleasure for me to be here and to talk to everyone today. And if everyone's, anyone ever says that Chicago is a large city, you come into a room and you sit down and your executive assistant's mother was the person who worked for the person who's running the meeting. <laughs> That's, I think, one degree of separation. <laughs> I'd like just to introduce a, a few people first before I, before I start talking. And I'd like uh, the people who are here who are trustees of my university to please stand, starting with Bud. Peterson, Anita Nagler, Ed Kaplan, Joel Kraus, Jim Hill. And if there's another trustee here that hasn't stood, they should stand now. <laughs> the worst thing about being president is you can never forget anyone, you know? And uh, I'm not gonna name them all, but I'd like all of the deans who are here of our various colleges to please stand. All right, here we go. <laughs> First of all, I, I'd just like to talk a little about our university and just make sure everyone understands. Everyone thinks we're many things, but actually we are many things. And uh, these are the schools we have, and I, I just want to go through them quickly just to remind you what everything is at our university. So the first is architecture. Uh, we are obviously the architecture department that was started by Mies van der Rohe. And we're famous because we have more Mies van der Rohe buildings on our campus than anywhere else in the world. And we're also one of the few urban campuses that was actually designed by one architect. So that's a, a really important part that we have just a, a great architecture school that's ranked within the top 10 in the country. Next is engineering, and we just have an outstanding engineering department with all of the major engineering departments you would expect. But just to get to some of the things that have happened, I think the biggest uh, alumni we have is Marty Cooper, yeah. who invented the, the cell phone, and you see him now in adverts because he invented the cell phone. And in the adverts, you see a young man, and every time I see Marty, I say, I keep seeing you on an advert, Marty, for inventing the cell phone. And he goes, yes, but why didn't they pick someone who was more handsome, <laughs> more like me? <laughs> Science, uh, Susan Solomon, uh, the person who went to the Antarctic uh, and actually was able to explain why the, the hole in the ozone was expanding and how humanity had affected that was one of our undergraduates. And uh, we have many others who have done great things, but this is typical of our science. And at the moment, computer science is the biggest department in uh, the science college and is growing enormously quickly. In fact, uh, every time they talk to me, they say, you have to give me more space more rooms, more faculty lines, because it is a really great story. And out of our computer science department are many of the young scientists who actually were part of the success story of Cleversafe. If you all know that Cleversafe was a startup that actually started on our university and uh, eventually became too big for our tech park, our incubator, moved downtown, grew, and was eventually uh, bought by IBM last year for $1.3 billion. Applied Technology is our newest school, 
that actually is only five years old. We started it as a school because we saw that in universities, in order to start brand new things, you sometimes need to start something new. So we started a new college where new degree programs that don't fit within the rest of the university could start. And uh, actually, this is our fastest growing college and uh, actually will soon be the third largest college that we have in the university within uh, three years. They're very focused on everything related to uh, intellectual property and uh, also uh, IT technologies. Next one's human science, and this is a new college also for us because we decided we should bring together the groups in our university, that are humanities, social science, <clears throat> and uh, psychology into one group. Uh, they all had very common things. They're in the world of technology, but they're in these other worlds that are more related to humanity, so therefore the human sciences. And in this group, we have just two outstanding parts of psychology at the graduate level that are nationally ranked. Business uh, <coughs> is the Stewart School. It's uh, at our downtown campus and on our main campus, the Mies campus. And uh, here we have one of the top ranked programs in finance in the world that actually was grown out of Chicago and the need for people to understand the technology behind finance. In design, any of you listening to the radio these days will find out that uh, there's a program going on just now to show the artwork in, of Moholy Nash. Um, Laszlo Moholy Nagy was the person who came from the Bauhaus in Germany to our university and really founded the Institute of Design. Uh, so actually in our history we have uh, Mies van der Rohe and uh, Moholy Nagy who both were instrumental after the Second World War coming and building world class programs within our university. And the last is our law school, Chicago Kent. Here we have just uh, some of the best uh, lawyers in the country. Uh, we have an amazing uh, results on anyone taking the bar exam <laughs> and we have uh, amazing results of all of our uh, students from the law school who go on into any competition and they do incredibly well. And uh, Abraham Lincoln Maravitz uh, is a very famous uh, lawyer in this state, uh, one of the first uh, Jewish lawyers uh, to actually make it to the national level uh, and he's one of our graduates also. So just as a quick review of our university to realize we're all of these things. Many people think we're just uh, architecture or just engineering, but we're all of these things. If we uh, go forward, uh, this is the mission of the university, and I just bring this up because this is something that we're very keen to preserve going forward. And the key words here are distinctive and relevant education and in an environment of scientific, technological, and professional knowledge creation and innovation. <laughs> And innovation is why we're here today. And I'm here to talk to you about the future of innovation at our university. A couple of other things that you should know about us before I talk about innovation. We are a global university in Chicago. Now, what do I mean by that? We have students from 100 countries. We have students from every state apart from Wyoming. Not sure what's wrong with Wyoming. <laughs> people just say to me there are no people there. But we're trying hard to get someone from Wyoming. <laughs> so if you think about that, uh, what does this mean, a global university? 50% of our students, uh, we have a large university, undergraduate and graduate, 50% of our students, the majority in our graduate programs, but about 25% uh, in our undergraduate programs from outside of the country, the rest from within the United States, the majority from Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin, of course. So what does this mean? This means that students who are coming to our university learn to be global in the university. Students who are global learn what it's like to be in the United States by being with our uh, students. I'm very pleased to say that this year, uh, maybe for the second time, uh, the US News and World Report started to, re to report uh, universities that were very global and they did it as a very positive thing that the future of everyone is to be global and we ended up ranked as the number three global university in this country and I'm very proud of that that we have this ability uh, for all of our graduates to go anywhere in the world and have no fear because they will be able to meet another Illinois Tech graduate in the country they go to. So let's talk about the future a little. What is it that we actually want to do? And it's actually summed up here. We want to be the university where creative students interested in, in technology become innovators and entrepreneurs. 
Why is this important? This is important because the future is not based on things that you can read about anymore and things that you've learned and remembered. The future is about taking knowledge that you've developed over time and doing something completely new with it. The future is to be creative. You have to be a creative engineer. You have to be a creative technologist. You have to be creative in whatever you do. You also have to be able to work with people, work with teams. You have to be able to sell ideas. You have to understand the impact of your ideas. You have to understand if the ideas can become enterprise. So that's where we see the future for our graduates, that success for them will be by being creative and actually leading creative enterprise. And we're actually working in our university so that every student who's an undergraduate will actually have the ability to be taught by the Institute of Design, one of the leading groups in creativity in the world, about the techniques by which you can take creative thought and do something with it. Creative thought either on your own or creative thought by working with a group of people. We're very interested in having all of our students at the undergraduate level understand what it is to actually practice creativity and innovation. And this means that we have team-based abilities. We have a program called IPRO. It's a two-semester sequence of courses that all undergraduates must take that are part of our core curriculum, which is very unusual. And it means they must go into a group and be taught by the business school, by psychology, by ID, about how to actually think about creativity and how to be in a team, how to put together an idea, how to actually think about how ideas move forward and how to build a prototype. And the reason that that's important is whatever your idea is, if you can't build a prototype and then test the prototype, you can't take the idea forward. So our university is really focused in this concept that you should actually take your creative ideas and do something with it and build a prototype. And then once you have that prototype, you should take your prototype somewhere to a customer of that prototype and let them use it and then refine your idea through feedback from the customer. So this is the idea that we really started with. And a number of years ago, we decided that what we should have is a facility to allow our students to actually practice creativity, practice innovation. And if they wanted to be an innovator, then there should be people there that can help them understand how to become an entrepreneur, how to take their ideas and turn it into enterprise if they're an innovator. Now, we understand that not everyone can be an entrepreneur, but we understand that everyone should understand what entrepreneurship means and how to be successful as an entrepreneur, either inside an organization or starting your own organization. It's important for the student of the future to know this. This is in addition to being an electrical engineer, in addition to being a computer scientist. This is a level on top of the normal thought of what we should be doing in a university. This is our view that our graduates should be successful for life. There should be a career that develops with them because they went to our university. The idea shop that we built was our prototype of this idea. It was about 13,000 square feet. Uh, and we started working in it and discovered that actually the students love this to the point that we opened up the idea shop that students could come and just take their creative ideas and do things regardless of whether it was for a course or not. Yes, they were there for the iPro courses, but they could also go there and build things. Inside there is all the ability to do uh, all of the 3D printing that's popular now, etc. but to actually make things, a maker space. And as we did this, we discovered that actually this space was woefully inadequate for everything our students wanted to do. And at that time, I started talking to Ed Kaplan, actually, about we needed to have a much bigger space. And we ended up thinking about uh, this. And eventually, Ed stepped forward with a number of other trans, uh, trustees, but especially Ed, and said, I, I'm going to give you the, the starting funding that will enable this project to go ahead. And I'd like to thank Ed Kaplan for that at this time. So this August, uh, we decided that we should uh, actually do the groundbreaking and begin the work of planning and all of the work that has to go, go through before you actually start construction. And uh, we, before that, we'd gone through a whole uh, process to pick an architect. 
and obviously the architect that was chosen is here, and I'm going to ask him to talk in a minute about just what it is we're going to build in the campus. But I think everyone should realize this is the first academic building that we've built in our campus uh, for over 40 years. And uh, this was a great day. You can see the mayor there. You can see Ed and uh, many other people uh, happily uh, digging ground in, in uh, Morton Park. So what's the vision of this? The vision is quite straightforward. The vision of this building and this idea is we want to attract students who fit our vision. We want creative students to come to our university and see that this is the place that if you're interested in technology, you can come and actually turn your ideas into significant viable innovations. We want them to be leaders, inventors, and entrepreneurs of the future. So that's a bold statement. Uh, this statement was put together by our faculty, by our trustees, in a long process that took over a year as we really wrestled with what it is it this really means. So here are some outcomes that we hope to happen. Uh, we hope that these creative students will come to our university and be able to do this. Uh, our undergraduates will acquire a superior capacity to innovate and will have the opportunity to participate in entrepreneurial activity. And that innovative ideas will result in new enterprise. So what is it we're seeing? We're going to value creativity among our student body, among our faculty, among our friends. This new Ed Kaplan Family Center for Innovation and Tech Entrepreneurship will hopefully be the hub of, an, of a, a group that attracts entrepreneurs, that attracts people interested in working with uh, young minds that really want to do th things, that want to really uh, be with our students, uh, want to work with our students, want to help our students in order for them to take their ideas forward. <laughs> We've decided as a university we will not own intellectual property or claim intellectual property of any undergraduate because of this, because we value the fact that our students will develop their own intellectual property themselves and be able to take it forward. I think when I look forward uh, to the university, My greatest hope is that this uh, innovator, this entrepreneur will do wonderful things and that as I end, I'm hoping that she will be the greatest engineer that we've ever seen. John, would you like to talk? Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, just to kind of piggyback on what Alan was saying, it, it, there was a time when knowledge and skills were why you went to college and how you got ahead, and then those days are really over, and um, now it's about creativity and an entrepreneurial s spirit, which are the keys to success. So this has really changed the role of the university in the ways that Alan has described, and uh, our buildings, therefore, need to change as well. So I'm going to take you through what is the Innovation Center. And um, it's really more than just another classroom building. It's an idea factory. It's a place of creative collision where uh, students and faculty and people from all departments can interchange and, and exchange ideas and, uh, and, and come up with new ideas uh, that will lead to success in the future. These are the goals. Uh, Probably don't need to go through those again. Alan uh, described those very uh, carefully <clears throat> and well. Um, so if we're talking about a building for collaboration, uh, collaboration really works better <clears throat> when everybody's on one floor, right? Rather than separated by floors in, in, a, in a tall building. It's hard to collaborate with someone when they're two floors above you, separated by elevators. So um, this influenced the, uh, the, the site that we chose for the building. These were, uh, so what you see here is uh, the campus of IIT. Here's State Street here. Here's uh, Crown Hall, for those of you that know the campus. Uh, the buildings in orange on this are the ones uh, by Mies van der Rohe. And uh, projected uh, buildings by Mies are the ones, the, the pale ones uh, that were never built with the, the little surrounding hatched outline. 
These were the sites that we looked at for the building. Some of them lent themselves to more of a horizontal building. Some lent themselves to more of a vertical kind of tower, which we didn't feel was appropriate for a building uh, about collaboration. The site we settled on is right here. And uh, it's just north of Herman Hall, which you see here in this empty space, which used to be a parking lot. Uh, and it's uh, kind of right in the middle of campus because this building will not be owned or kind of ruled by any department. It will be for everybody. It's the only building on campus that is under the control of the provost, and it's really for all departments. So we centered it right in the center of campus. This is what the site looks like right now. It's kind of an open field. Um, this is uh, from 1980, it was a uh, parking lot. <coughs> the trees that you see here surrounding the field are all ash trees. They're all in the process of succumbing to the emerald ash borer, so they'll be gone within the next uh, year or so. So this is, this is a, a plan, Mises plan for the campus from 1941. Our site is located right here. This is uh, uh, the, the campus there. That's uh, Mies explaining the campus to one of his students in one of the only known photos of Mies smiling. <laughs> Mies uh, designed the campus on a 24 foot by 24 foot grid, as you can see in that lower image there. And the reason for that was that Mies saw the building as primarily three types of buildings, classrooms, laboratories, and then the communal buildings like the, the library and the student center, which were for everyone. So the Kaplan Institute is really gonna be kind of a hybrid of all three of those kinds of buildings. It's gonna be a lab for new ideas, it's a classroom of the future, and it's, it's really designed for everybody on campus. So these are some of the early studies uh, so that, that of Mies van der Rohe, where he's testing out this 24-foot grid. So you can see this is kind of what we're moving away from, the teacher in the front with rows of desks. Um, so we had to really test. So here's the campus again overlaid with that structural grid, and you can see the impact of that 24-foot grid uh, over the campus, which we wanted to respect, but we didn't accept it uh, unconditionally. So we tested it ourselves. We asked. Uh, professors from the Institute of Design to just sketch out what is their ideal classroom. For your classroom, what is the ideal setup? So we, we asked uh, over, I think, 25 professors responded, and then we tested out how could we design uh, such that we could accommodate all these different setups. And in doing so, we kind of verified this 24-foot module, so uh, we took off from that. There was a very extensive uh, programming phase that preceded the design, and this involved all the uh, teachers on campus, uh, many, uh, many of the students. Uh, so there's a lot of input coming from all directions. It, it gets tabulated in this form, and this becomes the basis of the design. These are some early studies uh, testing out possibilities on the site. And then this is the building where we are, uh, where you can see uh, Herman Hall uh, here, and then the new building here. The new building is designed, uh, organized around these two open air courtyards that you see, uh, that visitors enter uh, through the building. And those are kind of like the eyes and the lungs of the building. They bring light and air uh, into the interior. We want a very open, flexible building, very light filled building. So if we take the roof off there, you can see the second floor. This is where the Institute of Design will be. And you can see the different kinds of spaces there. There'll be open spaces, <coughs> open studio spaces like this. There'll be enclosed uh, classrooms. There'll be project rooms where a group of maybe six to 12 students can have an ongoing project and keep it in that room. So it's designed uh, so that students can move fluidly between kind of thinking and making. And the space is very flexible and the furniture can all move around. This is a view from inside looking uh, from this flexible space through one of these courtyards that bring light deep into the floor plate of the building. This is the ground floor here. So um, we enter the building, the main entrance here, or from the west through the smaller courtyard, and we end up here with the concierge. There's a cafe here. Uh, there are studio spaces here. So this is where the iPros, or undergraduate uh, entrepreneurial courses, are taught. So students will uh, work collectively here, and then they'll break up into smaller groups. These are little curtains that can be uh, pulled out to subdivide the space so it can be one big open space or it can be subdivided and then the furniture is designed to create small clusters too so maximum flexibility on uh, the part of the building user. 
This is a big stair, kind of a tribune stair for lectures and TED Talks. Uh, behind the cafe is an assembly space uh, where, st where students can put together their prototypes. And then we have a maker space here, which is state of the art. So we can think, the students can kind of get together, think, come up with ideas, quickly make something, and do that process all over again. Okay, so here's, this is inside, looking to the right is the courtyard outside, which is also a collaboration space. Uh, there's no real kind of outdoor controlled uh, spaces on campus. Most of the outdoor space is residual between buildings. It's not real conducive to kind of meetings and so forth. So this will be kind of all, almost like two outdoor rooms and we'll have furniture out there in the, in the, uh, when the weather allows. Uh, and then this is, these are these two courtyards, so I can actually move through the building without ever entering the building. I can, uh, as a visitor, come through into this courtyard, go up this stair, which connects outside to this other terrace, and then back down and out. And I can look inside and see all the projects going out without ever actually entering the building. This is a view of the main entrance, so we're kind of going into that first courtyard, looking into the iPro studio, and heading towards the front door. These are some other views. On the top is looking north from Footlick Lane. So the building cantilevers out on the second floor to kind of provide shading for the lower floor, but also to sort of assert itself uh, amongst these other Mesian uh, buildings on campus. And these are some collages, kind of Mesian collages, showing how uh, one will get glimpses of this building from different uh, spots on campus, but never see it in its kind of complete entirety. The building is innovative uh, in its own right, the, um, <clears throat> in, a, in a couple ways. The, the second floor of the building is, is enclosed in a dynamic facade of ethylene, tetrafluoroethylene, which is a, uh, a thin, clear foil, almost like a clear Teflon, that is air supported. It's 1% the weight of glass and it has very uh, uh, energy advantages, <coughs> which I'll explain in a minute. The structure of the building actually heat and cools the building. So in this diagram here, in the concrete floor, there's a metal deck here with concrete floor, and then we have radiant tubing in there that's hot and cold tubes, and it transforms that metal deck into a radiant panel. So we're actually using the structure to heat and cool the building. This is uh, a, a view of that ethylene tetrafluoroethylene, or ETFE. My client was a, a chemist, so uh, was kind enough to <laughs> diagram ethylene tetrafluoroethylene for me. <laughs> it's wonderful to have clients that are not intimidated by technology, I have to say. <clears throat> This is the uh, section through the second floor, so you can see someone standing here, and then this uh, film uh, that moves. So it's comprised of four layers, and the inner layers here can move back and forward. So by, by inflating differentially the different cavities, we can move the inner layers back and forward. So the reason that matters is that we can, in the morning, let's say, or uh, at certain times of the day, we can allow more sunlight to enter the building. So we can modulate the amount of solar energy and solar radiation uh, according, just by moving this facade. So we can fine tune it uh, and it can change in real time uh, according to climate and weather and time of day. So here we're letting it in and then if we move uh, that uh, inner layer back out, we can bounce the light out. So during uh, in the <coughs> east facade in the morning, we can let, let, lice, let uh, less light in. Uh, and as the sun moves around in the sky, we can open that up and let more daylight in. This is how it works. So the two inner layers are patterned with these dots. And then when we press them together, we're creating a smaller area for the light to get through. So this is tied to a building automated automation system. So the building is automatically kind of moving uh, according to climate, uh, according to the weather even. So we can tie this to a weather station, for example. If it's gonna be a cloudy day tomorrow, we can open the whole building up. If it's gonna be a sunny day, we can close it down selectively on certain sides. One of the advantages of this film is that it spans great distances. Uh, so these are some of the early panelization studies. 
uh, for the facade. This is um, uh, later, so we were kind of uh, in reference to the running bond brick, brick pattern that needs to use throughout the campus. Um, this was the direction. This is viewing the building in the daytime. So the outer layer of the building is uh, white. The inner layer is kind of a dark silver. So it's, you'll be able to register that change in the facade. The second floor cantilevers out and kind of floats over the ground floor, which is all glass to allow uh, passers-by to look in and see what the students are doing and, and shade uh, the lower level. It's one of the few, only three 24-7 buildings on campus. So students can come to this building all the time. So anytime you're there, day or night, there'll be students working on their projects there. This is the view from State Street. So the building at night will have this kind of lantern-like quality to sort of draw the students in, like moths to the flame. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. A few months ago, Jay and I were talking, and he said, maybe sometime you'll come and speak at the City Club. And I said, sure. I didn't know that he would ask me to do this over the lunch course, but <laughs> thank you, Jay. So we have a few questions uh, for our speakers here. Uh, this first question is from Elizabeth Foster. And uh, the question is, where else in the US is the ETHF tech being used? ETFE. Yeah. ETFE, yeah. I'm sorry. So if you watch football, the, um, the new Minnesota Vikings football stadium, the roof is made of ETFE. Um, you'll see it in uh, canopies on zoos. It's, it's becoming more and more uh, used. It was a technology that was originally developed for sailboat sails. And the inventor was a German uh, scientist, and he realized quickly that its real application was not in uh, sailing, but in architecture. And um, if you've ever seen the Eden Project in Cornwall, England, um, it's kind of like a biosphere dome. That's a famous example of it. Also, the uh, water cube at the Beijing Olympics also had a facade of ETFE. The next question is from Jeffrey Bayer. Do I have that right? Uh, the inflatable window system, was, uh, has this been done anywhere else before? And the second question is, what is the anticipated lifespan of this system? Yeah, it, it's, it's been done before in skylights, but it's never been done before on a facade. And um, its material hasn't been used in Chicago, so we had to go through uh, standards and tests uh, with the city to get it approved. Um, it has interesting uh, fire. Um, it's not a plastic, so it doesn't get old and yellow and brittle like a plastic does. And Alan can, Alan's a material scientist, so I'm going to let him talk about that. But um, it doesn't really have uh, a, a, a lifespan like a plastic does. It doesn't change its appearance, but um, it can be replaced after. I think the warranty is for 30 years. So, um, and then in a fire, in the event of a fire, it just kind of evaporates. So plastic will melt and drip, uh, which is a problem in a fire. Um, and this material just literally evaporates. So it actually is, performs very well in a fire because the first thing that the fire department will do when they get to a building on fire is, does anyone know? They break the windows, yep, to let the smoke out. So this, um, this material will burn, will, will just open up and, and self-vent the building. So this actually has nice properties that way. So I, I learned from uh, the great Paul Green that the moderator can ask questions at any point. So I'll ask the next question. Uh, being from a, from a higher education institution, Loyola University of Chicago, you know, one of the challenges we oftentimes have with with buildings and, and those who are going to occupy them, faculty, is everybody wanting their own space and working within their own, their own labs or offices on things. 
um, how is the concept designed in the, in the layout of this building to foster more collaboration, interdisciplinary work among faculty, and uh, to invite students into the projects? Yeah, that's a great question. There is resistance on the part of older faculty members who are used to, uh, used to having an enclosed private office. Um, we're, we're encouraging them to, to be more out in the open in kind of more what they call a kind of a benching, uh, uh, open kind of benching situation. But you design the building differently when you want interaction and collaboration. You don't design it for the most efficient circulation. You actually design it so that people have to kind of bump into each other. So by kind of putting essential things further away. It's not unlike, um, you know, designing a grocery store. If you go to the grocery store, you know, the, the crafty uh, grocers, uh, they put the, the milk, the eggs, and the bread in different corners of the store, right? It's about getting you to move uh, through the store and buy other things uh, that you really didn't come there for. So it's, it's, a, it's akin to that, right? So the cafe is kind of, you create these kind of magnets or what we call collision nodes where people are going to intersect uh, necessarily. They have to. Um, so it, it's a thing that can be designed and created. The, the cafe itself would be a real magnet on campus uh, because there's going to be cafe seating there both inside and outside. And I think it's the only place on campus where if I'm a faculty member and I, let's say, have a, I want to have a coffee with a colleague from a different department, I can go there and actually sit down and, and, and see work. And while I'm there, I can see what people are working on. So it's how you situate things and really how you design the circulation. Yeah, what, one of the major groups that are going to be in the building is our Institute of Design. They're going to move their graduate programs there because the Institute of Design is the key to uh, this whole concept working in the university. And we're fortunate the Institute of Design, uh, they tend to work in these very open spaces anyway, so their faculty are not really in the situation of sitting wanting their own office because all of their students work in more studio model the same way as architecture does. Uh, so what we're seeing is that this uh, new model is uh, people will have their offices elsewhere, but they'll come here to do the collaborative work. And the space will be designed with the student in mind uh, in order to be able to do collaborative work together. So I think that's the difference. Uh, we're not saying that this is, uh, you know, everyone that works there gets their own office and that's where they are. This is a place you go to do uh, innovative work with others in a team-based uh, situation. So uh, we're really hoping that we can get to the situation that people are very comfortable just going there, meeting the people who are there, talking about their ideas, and then taking them forward. Okay, are there any other questions? Can I say something about Paul Green? Oh, please. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, you, you all know Paul probably better than I do, but um, I have, uh, I live in 860 Lakeshore Drive, and I have two uh, kind of rambunctious uh, the young daughters that, that make a lot of noise. And uh, Paul had the great misfortune of living in the apartment below us. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he was always um, uh, very, uh, approached everything with humor and grace. And um, although I didn't know him as well as you did, I, I miss him already. Thank you. It was nice of you to say.